Hello and welcome to Killer Bites, a true crime cooking show that's the perfect amount of crazy as it is delicious. If this is your first time watching Killer Bites, you may be taken aback by the combination of food and crime, but we found the two elements balance each other out pretty nicely. In today's episode, we'll be talking about Lord Lucan's disappearance while making the traditional British dish, bangers and mash. If you're curious, the recipe is in the description below. When Lord Lucan vanished one Thursday evening, tensions were high. His kid's nanny had just been executed in the basement and his estranged wife was trying to frame him for it. He insisted he was innocent in the few exchanges he had that evening, but never showed himself ever again. Now it's been almost 50 years and no one can say for certain what happened to Lord Lucan or where he went. I'm gonna start off by heating up butter in a pan and sauteing onions. On the evening of November 7th in 1974, a woman rushed into a London pub screaming, help me, help me, help me, I've just escaped from being murdered. He's in the house, he murdered the nanny. This woman was Veronica Duncan or Lady Lucan. She was covered in vital fluid and very shaken up. She said her estranged husband, Richard John Bingham, AKA Lord Lucan, just attacked the nanny and the kids were still there. Cops and medics immediately rushed to Veronica's home in Belgravia to check things out. The kids were in their rooms untouched, but when officials got down to the basement, that's when things got bad. Since there were no lights on, the officers shone their flashlights and made their way down. The walls were spattered in red fluid and male footprints were tracked through the pools of fluid on the grounds. By the basement kitchen was a sack that also had red all over it. Because if you can't already tell, this was a gruesome scene. When officers looked into the sack, they found the lifeless body of Sandra Rivet, the family nanny. They assumed she had been bludgeoned with the bandage wrapped blood pipe that was recovered in the hallway. Since Veronica was upstairs when the incident occurred, officers interviewed her at length. Here's what she said. That night, Sandra put the kids to bed and asked Veronica if she wanted a cup of tea. Veronica said yes, so at around 9 p.m. Sandra went down to the basement to make it. By 9.15, Veronica wondered what was taking Sandra so long, so she decided to go downstairs to check in on her. Veronica called out Sandra's name, but there was no response. Then out of nowhere, a male came up from behind and whacked Veronica in the head with the lead pipe. Veronica naturally started to scream, which prompted the assailant to say, shut up. When she heard the man speak, Veronica knew it was her estranged husband, Richard. With that, Veronica grabbed Richard by the throat and started fighting back. Then she went straight for his money makers down below and squeezed as hard as she could. That's what freed her from his grip. Works like a charm every time. According to Veronica, she asked Richard where Sandra was and he said he killed her. At that point, it was life or death. Veronica was worried that she and her three kids might meet the same fate as Sandra, so she had to think something up and quick. Veronica told Richard that she could help him escape and led him upstairs. While Richard was in the bathroom cleaning up, it was the perfect opportunity for Veronica to escape. So she got out as fast as she could without even grabbing her kids. And that's when she ran into the pub. Once Veronica finished telling the police her account of events, she told them she thought Richard accidentally executed Sandra, thinking it was her in the darkness. After telling her side of the story, Veronica was rushed to the hospital to get medical attention for her intense head injuries. And police officers continued to search the scene. At 10.30 that night, Richard called his mother. He said something bad happened and he needed her to pick up his three kids. But when Richard's mom pulled up, police officers were everywhere. She filled the police in on the situation between Richard and Veronica, which is that they separated two years prior and were fighting over who got custody of the kids. Richard's mom told the cops that her son now lived in a flat nearby, and she took the kids home with her while the investigation continued. Obviously, the next move would be to interview Richard, so the police went to his flat, but he was nowhere to be found. Well, that's not suspicious at all. Inside, investigators found Richard's passport, wallet, checkbook, driver's license, glasses, and car keys. His blue Mercedes was still parked outside, but the battery was dead, and it apparently had been that way for a while. Later, officials found out Richard had been borrowing a Ford Corsair from a friend, and he had taken the car about 45 miles away to Upfield, Sussex. There, he showed up at the home of his friends Ian and Susan Maxwell Scott. Ian wasn't home, but Susan was. She opened the door and saw a disheveled Richard. Susan said he was still wearing his daytime clothing that looked stained and partially cleaned off. Daytime clothing? I guess there are different outfits for different times of the day when you're an aristocrat. Now I'm gonna add in coconut sugar and balsamic vinegar. Susan said Richard told her that his wife was framing him for a crime and he was gonna lie doggo, which is the 1970s British slang for hiding out or flying under the radar. Richard then gave Susan his account of events. He said he was walking in Belgravia that night when he stopped to look through the basement window, the one of his old home that he no longer lived in. 
This was a typical thing for Richard to do. At one point, he hired a private investigator to spy on his wife and kids. Anyway, Richard claimed he casually peeped in the window and saw Veronica being attacked by a man. Being the chivalrous lord he was, Richard let himself in the home and ran downstairs, but he slipped in a pool of fluid and Veronica's attacker got away. After that, Richard said he helped calm Veronica down and the two went upstairs to clean up. But as soon as he got into the bathroom, Veronica ran away screaming murder. At that moment, Richard realized things looked really bad for him, so to avoid being framed as a suspect, he fled. But he insisted he was innocent and came to the conclusion that Veronica hired a hitman to snuff the nanny and frame him for the crime. Okay, but if Richard really was innocent, running away makes him seem even more guilty. Richard made four phone calls that night that we know of. The first was to Madeline Florman, a friend and neighbor of his. Sometime after 10 p.m., Madeline woke up to the sound of her phone ringing. She answered and heard a man's voice on the other end. She said she thought it was Richard, but he sounded distressed and was incoherent. Tired and confused, Madeline put the phone down and went back to sleep. A little bit before that phone call, Madeline said someone was frantically ringing her doorbell, but she thought it was just some teens ding-dong ditching her. The following morning, she found spots of vital fluid on her doorstep, so it was theorized that Richard was the man at her door. The second phone call Richard made that night was the one to his mom where he asked her to pick up his kids. That was around 10.30 p.m. The third phone call was to a guy named Bill who was married to Veronica's sister. So I guess that means Bill was Richard's brother-in-law, but since he and Veronica were separated, maybe that makes him his ex-brother-in-law? Whoever Bill was to Richard, he didn't answer. After that call is when Richard showed up at Susan's house. She let him in and at 12.15 in the morning, Richard borrowed her phone to call his mom again. He wanted to check and make sure she got the kids. Richard's mom said yes and then asked him to go to the police. He responded, I'd rather not. I'll be in contact with them first thing in the morning. Yeah, right. Sometime around 1 a.m., Richard left Susan's home. She tried to convince him to stay so they could go to the police later that morning, but he just said he had to get back and he drove off, never to be seen again. Once this part of Richard's timeline was discovered, the police asked Susan why she never reported the visit. She claimed to have not known that he was wanted at the time, even though this story and Richard's name were unavoidable in the following days. Newspapers, TV reporters, and radio broadcasters were all talking about the high society aristocrat who is now a wanted criminal. Now let's put our bangers in the oven. So here are the only other things we know for sure about Richard's whereabouts. The next day, he postmarked two letters to Bill. And in the trend of this case, one of the envelopes had smears of red on it. In the first letter, Richard told the same story he told Susan and then asked him to watch over his kids. In the second, Richard gave Bill instructions about an upcoming sale that would satisfy bank overdrafts. Because even though the guy was high class, he was also a gambler who lost a few bets. He signed that letter as Lucky, which was a nickname his gambling friends called him, although I don't know how accurate that name is. Richard also sent a letter to Michael, a friend who lent Richard the car. Unfortunately, Michael threw away the envelope, so there's no way to tell when it was sent. Gee, thanks, Michael. In this letter, Richard asked Michael to tell his kids he cares about them. He didn't go into detail about what happened, but said, Judging by my last effort in court, no one, let alone a 67-year-old judge, would believe, and I no longer care except that my children should be protected. Yo, I'm glad you love your kids, but if you truly love them, you wouldn't slay their nanny and try to do the same to their mom. Three days after the incident, the Ford Corsair Richard was driving was found abandoned in New Haven. When officials searched the interior, they found fluid from at least two different people and a piece of lead pipe wrapped in a bandage. It was just like the lead pipe found in the basement at Veronica's house, but this one didn't have any stains on it. Is it just me or does this feel like a real life version of Clue? I think it was Lord Lucan in the basement with the lead pipe. What do you think? Well, after Richard left Susan's house that night, he was never officially seen again, although many people reported sightings. Now I'm going to make the mashed potatoes. I have my potatoes steamed and cut up, and I'm going to add milk and butter. Police officers issued a warrant for his arrest, and everyone was searching for the seventh Earl of Lucan. Anyone who lived in England at the time knew all about this case. It was a huge deal. Sadly, though, people were more fascinated by Lord Lucan's actions since he was a posh aristocrat which means Sandra's story didn't get as much coverage and respect as it deserved. The specific details of her situation are pretty tragic too. She typically had Thursdays off and would hang out with her boyfriend in the evening. This particular week, she swapped her days off, meaning she saw her boyfriend on Wednesday and was home to take care of the kids on Thursday, which is the day she was attacked and slain. Which brings us to the first of many questions that surround this case. Did Richard mean to whack Sandra that evening? Most people say no. Since Richard and his private investigator were essentially stalking Veronica and the kids, Richard would know their schedule. 
And if he knew Sandra was typically off on Thursdays, that would give him the perfect window of opportunity to go after Veronica. But that poses another question. Was Richard even the perpetrator? Although there are many elements of the story that point to Richard as the perp, there are also a few things that back up the opposite argument. A lot of Richard's friends said this attack was not like him at all. He would never go after someone with a weapon like that in such a violent manner. Yeah, and my mom never thought I'd pass high school. Sometimes people have a way of surprising you. Another thought brought up in conversation was that Richard would never mix up his wife of several years with a new nanny. Whoa, I didn't even think about that. On the other side of things, people emphasize how dark it was in the basement that night and Sandra and Veronica were the same height, so it still is feasible for Richard to mix them up. So if Richard isn't the assailant, some case followers believe his side of the story, that Veronica hired a hitman and framed him. Others think Richard was the one who hired the hitman to go after his wife, but the hitman accidentally whacked Sandra instead of the intended target. As confusing as all these theories about who killed who and about what the motive was, there was something much bigger that puzzled the world for decades. Where the hell was Lord Lucan? Three years after the incident, Veronica wrote a letter that was published in the Daily Mirror, where she pleaded with Richard to just turn himself in already. But over time, she started to think he took his own life. This is the first main theory. Veronica believed her ex jumped off of a ferry, hoping he'd get caught under the propellers so he would never be positively identified. But there's another sub-theory that I like better. It's that, and I quote, Richard stuffed rocks in his pants after he realized his mistake and then I'm guessing jumped in a body of water with those rocks in his pants. It's a very vague theory, but I'm here for it. The second theory is that someone helped Richard out of the country, but realized it was super risky to be seen with him, so they whacked him and buried him in Switzerland. Theory number three is that he fled the country. The most popular destinations Richard is believed to have traveled to include South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, Ireland, France, and Greece. Yo, all those sound like great places to live in, so I wouldn't blame him if that's what he really did. This theory category is based primarily on sightings people have reported over the years, but none of them have ever been officially confirmed. The Australia sub-theory, however, comes from Sandra's son, Neil. When Neil eventually discovered that he was the son of the victim, he decided to conduct a thorough investigation of his own. In all of his sleuthing, Neil concluded that Richard is now Buddhist and living in Australia. Say what? Neil somehow found this 85-year-old English Buddhist man living down under and suspected him to be Richard. This is because the old man's friends say he has a mysterious past that does not add up, and a facial recognition test showed an 85% similarity between the old man and Lord Lucan. Neil recently presented his findings to Scotland Yard's cold case unit, and it is currently being investigated. And last, but certainly not least, the fourth theory, which is my personal fave. Richard took his own life and was fed to tigers. I thought Carol Baskin did that to her husband first. Looks like she took a page out of Richard's book. Two of Richard's closest pals said Richard went to a private zoo that was owned by his friend John. Rumor has it, Richard gathered a few people for a quick gossip sesh where he admitted to whacking Sandra. The group talked out the different outcomes and at the end of the conversation, a pistol was brought out and Richard was encouraged to do the decent thing. Richard then went to another room, held the pistol up to his head and pulled the trigger. After that, the zoo owner, John, apparently fed Richard to his tiger, Zora. OMG, this is blowing my mind right now. I had no idea there was another fed him to the tiger crime out there. When John's mom was asked about Richard, she said, the last I heard of him, he was being fed to the tigers at my son's zoo. But when John was asked about the situation, he said, my tigers are only fed the choicest cuts. Do you really think they're going to eat stringy old Lucky? Boom, roasted. All right, here is a rapid fire of all the loose ends of the story. In 1975, an inquest jury ruled that Richard was responsible for Sandra's demise. In 1999, Richard was legally declared deceased. But it wasn't until 2016 when his official death certificate was released. And that's when his son assumed the title. And most recently, in 2020, Neil presented his Australia theory, which detectives say they're still looking into. And that about does it for the story of Sandra's demise and Lord Lucan's disappearance. Actually, there are so many more details about Richard and Veronica's relationship, possible sightings, and other crazy story spinoffs, but this plate of bangers and mash is ready, and I'm about to dig in. See you again soon.